Hello, and in this video I'm going to talk about the cognitive interview, which is really a way of applying all the other information that you look at on memory. So all of the memory models, working memory model, multi-store model for example, and the information on eyewitness testimony, really all of this comes together and we say, well, what does this tell us? What does this show us? How can we use this information um, to try and help improve people's memory in quite an important area, obviously eyewitness statements uh, in court cases. So the reason that the cognitive interview came about was because actually what was happening, which is known in the research as the standard interview, which is what the police were doing at the time, is that police were interrupting people when they were talking. They may, might ask something like, did you see the red car? Um, and that obviously, as you know, as I've just said from past research, that's a leading question. Um, and so could mean people are given false eyewitness accounts. Um, and so researchers came in and said, well, how can we make this better then? How can we use what we know to actually create a good interview and a good way of getting people's information? Uh, and that good way they've called the cognitive interview and there are certain um, elements to it that, that you need to be aware of. Uh, so these are, first, there is report everything. Uh, and this is where interviewers are told to ask the interviewees to give all the minor bits of detail. So before, maybe they would have just given the, the key information. I don't know, uh, he's, they saw a thief who was six foot two, male, um, wearing jeans and uh, a hoodie. That's very broad. Uh, that could be thousands of people potentially. Whereas if they gave some more specific information that might seem irrelevant, such as maybe they saw a tattoo on the person's hand, uh, they were wearing red shoes, or there, there was some writing on their belt, that may seem irrelevant information, but actually that really narrows the information down. So that's the first element of the cognitive interview, reporting everything, giving all the details. Um, and the idea here is that it might narrow down the person, it could trigger other memories. And again, what, what we know about memory is that if we can give a cue, if we can give a trigger to information, retrieval failure is less likely. So we're more likely to, to recall that information. The second element is called context reinstatement. And this is where you get witnesses to get themselves back in the state of mind, imagine they're, they're in the environment they were when they witnessed the event. So if they were, if they seen a car crash, for example, they were really out there, it was a cold January night, um, it was dark, it was raining, uh, it was a Monday, so the person was really miserable and upset. They try and get the person to, to get back in that mindset. And again, this utilizes research that we know about. So we know context dependent forget getting happens. Um, I think it was Goddard and Badley looked at the, the study into the, the scuba divers. So you're more likely to recall information in the environment that you learnt it in. Um, so this is kind of trying to utilise that. Can we get people to try and think what they were thinking at the time, try and get them to imagine where they were, uh, what time of day it was. And again, that is in order to add cues to memory to prevent retrieval failure, to try and help trigger their memory and recall the, the important information. Next is change order, uh, and this means they ask witnesses to report the event back in a different order. So quite often the witness will say, oh, this happened first, then this happened, then this happened, and then that was the last thing. Well, the, con uh, the cognitive interview asks people to change that order. Okay, start from then. What was the last thing that happened? And then what happened before that? And then what happened before that? They might actually ask them to start in the middle. Right, start at the point where, um, I don't know, the, you saw the car revving up before it, it, it crashed. There would have been things happened before that, been things happened after that. Um, so the idea here with the change order is that you're getting to people, getting people to think more about the event. Um, they could potentially be using their visual spatial sketchpad if they're, they're reimagining it. Um, and it hopefully, again, maybe jogs people's memories and gets them to think more deeply about it. It's also harder to, to make up events. So if, if the, the memory wasn't actually real and in the standard police interview, they could have been, been making things up. If you're asked to, to try and process that information a bit more, again, which the, the working memory model focuses on, um, it's harder to, to do that. And so the idea is you're only getting the accurate information here. And that's true of the last part of the cognitive interview, which is change perspective. So this is where you're asked to give the account, give your witness 
statement from the perspective of someone else. So maybe it was another witness, maybe it was the victim, maybe it was the offender, maybe you're asked, I don't know, if you saw a car crash side on, you're asked to say what you'd have seen if you were behind one of the cars or, or even hovering above. Again, the idea here is that they're thinking about the information uh, a bit more. So those are the four things of the cognitive issue. This is what you need for your AO1. Report everything, context reinstatement, change order, change perspective. Um, and I've got the, the researchers there at the top that I didn't mention earlier. So that's Fisher and Geiselman. Uh, and they're the ones that kind of came up with the cognitive interview. There are the many studies done, as, as you're about to see, um, to, in, into different ways. Did, does it work or not? Uh, it's also worth noting that there was a uh, th this was developed further. So one of those researchers, Fisher, came up with what he called the enhanced cognitive interview. So the enhanced cognitive interview is using all those things I've just mentioned: um, report everything, change order, change perspective, context reinstatement. But as well as that, there are other things that have been found to work and found to help witness recall. Um, so it's things like having good eye contact, a good rapport between the witness and, and the interviewer, um, reducing their anxiety. I don't know, offer them a cup of tea, um, asking. Not asking, uh, yeah, sorry, asking open-ended questions, so not the, the leading questions. Not using jargon, so police jargon, for example, may have been used before. They might have spoken about a, an RTA, which is road traffic accident. Here they ask about the crashes in using normal language. Um, asking the interviewers to, to speak nice and slowly. Um, but, you know, they're not making a YouTube video, so that's why I'm speaking quite quickly. Uh, and also minimising distractions, so not having things going on in the background, loud noises, other people talking, things like that. All of these things, as well as doing the first four things from the original cognitive interview, have also been found to help. And again, there, there's research to kind of support that. Looking at this research then, we've got Geiselman et al. Um, and here they tested the cognitive interview against the standard interview. This was, I believe this one was the lab study. Um, so what happened here, they got participants, it was 120 participants in each group. Uh, 120 participants came in, watched a video of a robbery, a, a reenacted robbery, uh, and then were interviewed using the standard police interview. Uh, the second group of participants, another 120, came in, they watched the same video, but this time were interviewed using the cognitive interview. Uh, and what happened was it was a double blind study, so the people that were looking at the results, they didn't know which group was who. Um, obviously the participants didn't know that there was another condition either, independent groups. Um, and what they found was the people in the cognitive interview recalled about 35% more information uh, than those in the standard police interview. Um, and here are results looking at the statements that were made. So there were 41.1 statements on average made with a cognitive interview compared to 29.4 with the standard police interview. And by standard police interview, I meant what was going on at the time, as I've mentioned before, which was, uh, you know, participants were or witnesses were were interrupted and there were leading questions and things like that. So this research supports, at least in a lab, and again, you, you, you'll be good to be mindful of the way that the research was done. That was a video of a crime. It's going to be much less stressful than actually being in a crime. Uh, the consequences of getting the the criminal correct um, are going to be a lot less that they, they'll know they're in a lab. However, they still found that this cognitive interview did seem to work, which is great. Um, Fisher then tested the enhanced cognitive interview and compared this with the standard cognitive interview uh, and actually found that the enhanced cognitive interview gained more statements, even more than the cognitive interview alone. So that, that adds support that the Fisher, the extra bits, you know, uh, making people more calm and relaxed and not, not asking leading questions. Um, uh, talking in a uh, not not using jargon, talking in a slow way that that seemed to help even more, which is great. The issue with doing the study of the robbery on video, as I've just said, there, there are uh, research methods issues there in terms of external validity. Internal validity was good because you could control it, um, but external was poor. So to get around that, uh, they actually tested. Um, I believe it was the enhanced cognitive interview. Uh, using the Miami Police Department. So in real life um, crimes, 
officers were trained how to use the cognitive interview um, and they tested whether that worked against what was going on before the standard police interview. And what they found is that it did, yeah, there was about 46% uh, increase in statements given by witnesses compared to what was going on before. Uh, so this suggests that the cognitive interview, specifically the enhanced cognitive interview, does work and not only does it work in the lab but it works in real life crime as well. So this adds external validity to the fact. Um, and actually what they found was these, these statements were accurate as well that 99 no sorry 90 percent of the statements were able to be verified by maybe other witnesses or other evidence uh, which was great so it's all looking very rosy um Konkan et al did a meta-analysis in 1999 um of 42 studies, uh, it was 42, Some of the one of the textbooks says 50, another says 53, I've, I've gone back and looked at the actual um, article and it said it was 42 studies um, and they looked at a variety of, of different ones which is where you get up to the 50, but uh, meta-analysis um, and what they found was that the cognitive interview consistently gives more correct information than the standard police interview. So pretty much all the research is going in the same direction here in that the cognitive interview really Really does work uh, and it gets more statements than the standard police interview which is great uh, and there's, there's research to back it up as well. There are, it's not all rosy however, and there are potentially some issues um, and what this same meta-analysis found is although you're getting more correct statements, you're also getting more incorrect information. So they found that there was an 81% increase in correct information um, using the cognitive interview compared to the, the standard interview, but there was also an increase, 61% increase in incorrect information um, with the enhanced cognitive interview. So it's a bit of a balancing act. Okay, you're getting more statements and you are getting more correct statements, but with that comes more incorrect information. And how do you know which is which and, uh, and is it worth it? So it's not always um, plain sailing saying, yet yeah, this is a perfect um, way of getting eyewitness testimony. Uh, there, there, there are still issues there. And, and that's a, a link to the, the original article, if you're interested. Um, other evaluations then, you've got Milne and Bull um, and what they did is they tested the different parts of the cognitive interview. So you've got the three parts, cod context, reading, statement, report everything, change perspective, change order. Um, and they want to see, right, well, do they all work? And if they all work, are any more important than any others? And what they found was, yeah, if you just use each individual part, each of the four, each of them on their own are better than the standard interview on its own. So that's good. So each part does work. So that's one finding from Milne and Bull. The other is, however, that context reinstatement and report everything, these two, and that's why they're in bold, they were the more beneficial ones. They were the ones that actually work better um, than, than the other two. Um, and so suggests that it's yeah, the, the findings here are that, again, it backs up the idea the cognitive interview does work over the standard police interview. It also narrows it down a bit, and that becomes more important maybe when we look at the next evaluative point. The next point is probably a weakness of the cognitive interview, um, and the problem with with it is that it's, it is more time consuming. It's more time consuming to carry out. It's more time consuming beforehand because obviously you have to train the officers. So there's negatives there. You know, realistically in the field, there's hundreds, thousands of crimes. Are all officers going to be trained in it? Probably not. Um, and so, you know, are we going to be spending time actually training the officers, actually carrying this out when we've got so much work to get through. So the application may be limited by the actual method of doing it. However, if we add that to the Milne and Bull finding where the first two are more important, well, maybe maybe we can get around that by saying, okay, well, well maybe we can do those two, the context reinstatement statement report everything, um, because they seem to be the key ones that are better. Um, I've also mentioned, so this is all really AO3, there's the, the, the evaluative studies. Um, I've also mentioned the research methods. So either with the Geiselman and Fisher, or Fisher and Geiselman study, where one was done in a lab, one was done with the Miami Police Department, on their own, there are issues. So the lab study on its own, great internal validity, there was good control there. All the participants saw the same video for the same amount of time. You could verify what actually happened and check their results, which was great. Um, however, as I've already said, watching a video of a robbery is very, very different than actually being in a robbery and giving your answers where you could be more anxious, which again, our past research tells us could make us better or worse, um, or, 
the outcomes. So if you get the wrong person uh, in a lab, the participants will know it doesn't really matter, whereas in a, in a real life crime it matters. Ha doing that in the Miami Police Department, that, that adds to it and that's got good external validity. However, in that one, we don't know what's happened in the meantime. And you know, these people giving the statements, um, stuff could have, there could have been post event discussion. So again, other stuff for, from the rest of the spec. So when I've got the, the point there, research methods, you do need to bear in mind, obviously, that the study that was done, the methods that were used, and the, the the outcome that has on how much we can trust, how reliable, how, sorry, how valid the the results are. Finally, then I'll leave you with a couple of ways that this information can be assessed. Uh, so, first question: outline how to provide witness testimony using the cognitive interview. Six marks. That's kind of an AO one question, so you'd need to go through the four methods, report everything, context or statement, change order, change perspective, what they are, how they work. Um, the 60 marker there, um, the probably the, the more obvious 60 marker would probably be outline and evaluate the cognitive interview where you'd obviously for your AO1, your 6 AO1, you'd be talking about four aspects again, um, why they work and then evaluating it using the research that I said. But this is a potential question, discuss research into the cognitive interview potentially a harder question there. Remember that if it's a discuss question, you're still outlining evaluate, you've still probably got that breakdown of 6AO1, 10AO3. Um, and here where it says research into cognitivity, you will need to use those bits of research that we just spoke about there. Um, and you can maybe use a couple, maybe the lab study and the Miami study uh, for your AO1, and then evaluate that, backing that up with supporting research um, with the other bits we've looked at, Milne and Bull, um, Conk and the meta-analysis, uh, and then evaluating those studies as, you know, using either um, having good internal or external validity, depending on where, where the research was done. So I just wanted to highlight that to, to finish off with.